Welcome to Tea Talks Unfiltered, the podcast where we drink tea, we talk, and they're both unfiltered. My name is Jake, and I will be your host. And on today's episode, we will be drinking a recently discovered unnamed poor tea. And we're going to be discussing the Tao Te Ching. So, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Tea Talks. This week, pretty exciting. We are finally getting into the Tao Te Ching. We're going to be jumping into the deep end of the philosophical pool. So this is a text that is obviously really important to me now, but it wasn't something that I was introduced to until I came to Wudang in 2010. However, from a pretty young age, I feel like I've always been really greatly influenced by philosophy in general. Um, I've always enjoyed debating. I've enjoyed kind of asking big questions. I think it's really important to challenge yourself, your worldview, your perspective. And that's actually one of the first things that brought me to Wudang was an answer to one of those uh, what if questions uh, brought me here. So coming here and finding the Tao Te Ching, finding this text that had so many layers and so much to offer, you know, there's, there's points in there to be made about practice, about the way you live your life, about your personal philosophy, worldview, how you align yourself with nature and with society. It's such a dense book that's also very simple to read, that I find myself even now revisiting it and learning new things, finding new connections. And I think that that's really valuable. I'm pretty excited to be able to share a piece of that with you today. However, I do know that most of the audience listening to these tea talks, hopefully you're pretty well acquainted with the Tao Te Ching already. Hopefully you have a a, a translation or a few. Uh, You maybe have a favorite but you've probably read the book. You're probably pretty familiar with it. So I want to include a brief introduction to the Tao Te Ching, but instead of going through the entire thing, of course, we wouldn't be able to do that in one episode anyway. What I want to do is I want to share with you my top five chapters, just to give you a little bit of the theme of Tao Te Ching, uh, share with you some of my favorite points, some of my uh, chapters that I think I revisit the most often that I think are really uh, impactful for me. And so I'll share that with you, and I won't spoil the entire book if you haven't read it yet, but hopefully it'll give you a little window into the Tao Te Ching and some of the running themes uh, that it carries. If you do have a favorite version of the Tao Te Ching, you can grab that now, and we can get started. So, cheers. Okay, so... Getting into an introduction of the Tao Te Ching. I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly um, just to give you a little bit of background information, uh, but then we can spend a little bit more time working through the top five list. So starting off, the Tao Te Ching is written by the author Lao Tzu, which literally just means the old master, most likely a pen name. There is a lot of debate on uh, who Lao Tzu was. Uh, I think the general consensus is that he is the character Li Er, who is an imperial librarian in the Eastern Zhou dynasty. Uh, That's in 770 BC to 256 BC. So it is one of the most well-preserved kind of ancient texts, one of the most widely translated texts. I think it's pretty close to the Bible nowadays. You'll hear that reference come up quite a bit. Um, But that's also because the text itself is fairly short. It's only 81 chapters, and each chapter is less than a paragraph in some cases. Um, It's just a handful of characters even. Uh, The original Tao Te Ching was found with inscriptions on bamboo strips, right, and kind of rolled up. That was kind of the old, really traditional way of preserving texts. A lot of things were passed down orally, and things do change over the years. So there's a lot of um, kind of uncovering versions of the Tao Te Ching through, throughout different periods of history. Uh, mostly they're found in tombs or found in certain places where, you know, these books were preserved well. These, 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 these strips can still be read. And those are cross-referenced to kind of get a complete picture. Some of the biggest ones are from the, uh, I'm going to pronounce this incorrectly, but the Mo Wang Dui, uh, tombs, and, and this is from the Guodian uh, slips, the version that I'm going to be referencing. Uh, so those are, I think, from, I think Mo Wang Dui is, is from the uh, 1970s, and the most recent one is from the 1990s. There's probably more information always coming out on this, but this is a pretty complete text 
now. Uh, it's been translated an immense amount of times, but that's also because of its simplicity. Um, the text itself is not very long, even though the language it uses has been kind of drifted away from, and it's very difficult even for a Chinese native speaker to understand the Tao Te Ching because the way the text is written is not the way things are spoken or written today. Uh, so it's kind of written in that ancient traditional Chinese text that can be pretty hard to interpret even for a native speaker. So with translations, there's always some room for error. And I think it's really good to have multiple points of reference so that way you can kind of paint a better picture. Okay. So the Tao Te Ching, uh, regardless of who the historical character is, there is a pretty great, great legend that I like to share um, if you haven't heard of kind of the origins of the Tao Te Ching. Now, whether or not this is probably just a story that's crafted around the character Lao Tzu to give it some uh, weight, to give it some kind of uh, visual uh, character. Either way, I do enjoy the story, so I'll share this with you really quickly. So, Lao Tzu is well known as a cultivated sage, right? And so at one point, you'll see the pictures of Lao Tzu often depicted with a younger boy, his apprentice, and, and a water ox, you know, that he's traveling with, either walking beside or walking or, or, or riding, right? And this is how he's traveling across China. And at a certain point, I think there's this theme in any Taoist text where you'll see this kind of returning to nature, returning to the roots, um, kind of not necessarily separating from society, but in some way uh, moving towards a place where they can cultivate the Tao. They can align themselves with nature and, and kind of find their way. And that involves some kind of escape from reality, not reality, but escape from uh, regular society and civilization. And so the story kind of starts like that, where Lao Tzu is leaving, he's heading out with his knowledge so that he can begin his own cultivation, or at least enrich it, you know, reach a higher level uh, on his own practice. But at the border of China, as he's leaving to the wilderness, the official stops him and says, before you leave, you have to transcribe everything that you know so that if you're lost, then your knowledge won't be lost because he knows he's the wisest person in China. And Lao Tzu says, okay, and he transcribes all of his lessons, all of his analects, all of his, uh, you know, sagely wisdom, and then gives them that and then, you know, disappears, ascends or however. <laughs> and and that's kind of the legendary story, the, the opening of uh, the Tao Te Ching. So it's a collected uh, not a list, but it's a collected uh, kind of metaphor, allegory, uh, descriptions. It's really a dense book. It covers pretty much everything. You know, you've got everything from your like cosmic circle of life, meditation, qigong, uh, practice, balance in society, uh, warfare, um, even everything down to running a household and a government. And there's also even a really good method for cooking fish. So it has everything in the kitchen sink. Um, very, very comprehensive text. It was written with no punctuation. It was written with no divisions. That's been something that's kind of been established over time because that's the way they, the, 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 the historians and the academics believe that that's the way it would have been understood because the Tao Te Ching in itself is a conversation. It is it is something shared between people who kind of speak the same language. They're on the same page about specific qigong practices, uh, specific understandings of the universe, you know, of the Tao, of Taiji, of Yin Yang theory, of the five phases. All of these things taken together impact and are mentioned throughout the Tao Te Ching. So the way it's written, it's kind of written with the air of you know, the people, the audience receiving the text most likely are pretty well versed in a lot of these concepts, <clears throat> which makes the Tao Te Ching difficult to translate simply at face value. Because when you translate it, if you just translate the words and without explaining each aspect of it, a lot of it can be very vague and at, at its worst, potentially misleading because words can change their value over time. And so 
sometimes if you read it without having the information of the context of some of the culture, it can be difficult to understand the true meaning, um, specifically when you're applying it to a Qigong practice. That doesn't seem as apparent at first glance um, because it's talking about how to run a family, how to run a society, uh, how to, you know, uh, run an army at some point. And these kind of things don't necessarily directly fit with what we think of when we think of uh, meditation practices or breathing practices. But there is this similarity and kind of uh, big universe reflecting in the small universe idea that's very, very important in kind of the Taoist world, right? So Tao Te Ching has been kind of recognized uh, after the fact as the starting point of Taoism. So people who use this book, people who are involved in this conversation become known as Taoists because that is kind of the central theme of these texts is aligning yourself with the Tao. Um, these are the steps, right? So the Tao Te Ching, the book literally is two books in a way. It's the book of Tao and the book of De. So Tao is loosely translated as the way. Um, as long as we understand that that is a very vague piece of terminology, it is not, you know, absolute in any sense. So sometimes it's better left untranslated. Tao is just a representative word that we can use to uh, frame this meaning, right? The, on the other hand, is virtue. So that is kind of the, the uh, quality that you need to embody in order to walk the Tao, in order to walk the way. So we have the Jing, which is the classic. So we have the classic of virtue and the classic of Tao, okay? And so that's kind of the Tao Te Ching, okay? So the text that I'm going to be referencing, I should share that as well, is, is a really, really great text. I have to kind of plug it for a moment. Uh, this is written by uh, Gu Zheng Kun. It is, the, the, it is translated as the Book of Tao and De. Um, written in Wade's Guile system, so if you pronounce it here, the book of Tao and Te, T-E-H, instead of D-E. Um, so this is a really, really great text. This is actually my original one. I've had this one forever. Some of the pages are starting to come off. <laughs> um, but I really like this text. The reason why is because the author is Chinese, uh, who translates really, really well known, really well known for some of his translation work uh, throughout Beijing and throughout the world in different universities. Um, and in the text, he has a foreword, which is really nice to kind of introduce a lot of the bigger concepts that are that are prevalent throughout the text, you know, some of the themes. But then also when you get to each individual chapter, it has the pinyin, which is the uh, alphabetized version of uh, the the Hanza of the Chinese characters. And then you have the Chinese characters directly next to that. And then on the following page next to it, you have the English. So it's it's side by side represented. And that's, that's really nice. Um, that's really nice to have because it allows you to see some of the structure and you can see some of the similarities and some of the graces that, that have been taken during the translation. And if you're a little bit familiar with Chinese, it does help um, just to kind of see that transition. Because like I said, when you translate something, you're losing a little bit of its original uh, meaning just because it takes on a new meaning when you change the words, right? Things don't translate 100% perfect from one language to another. You know, there's there's a lot tied up in culture and philosophy that's just kind of ingrained in the way we talk and communicate to each other. And even now, with the amount of time that passes between the authorship and the translation that you're reading, uh, there's a quite a lot of cultural drift that happens there as well. So I like having this text because... Um, it's, it's well done, and there are notes that happen throughout. So if there's a special uh, character that's been changed or potentially adapted because other versions of the Tao Te Ching have been uncovered, there are, there are notes about that in this text. And it's, it's still written in a very nice, um, easy-to-read way, but with a, a fair amount of explanation uh, at the beginning. So a really nice text by Gu Zheng Kuan. This is the one I'm going to be referencing and reading from today. Okay. And also this edition, there's, there's like two editions, I think online, this edition is, is my favorite one because it's got like every page has got like artwork, um, in the background and every page is different. That's a really cool, like little feature. There's another version of this that's white. And I think it has Lao Tzu sitting underneath a tree on the cover. Uh, that's a later edition, 
maybe early edition. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but that one's also the same text. This has just been kind of uh, more uh, poetically, uh, I would say, designed, I guess. So Gu Kun, the book of Tao and De, um, really nice edition. But if you have a version, uh, I would suggest looking for one that has a good um, Chinese, maybe even opinion, side-by-side -side translation. That's always really valuable because you can kind of see the connections that are made, hopefully. Okay, so there is <laughs> the Tao Te Ching that I'll be referencing. So why only five chapters? And that's really just a time constraint <laughs> thing. I, I was making this list uh, last couple of days and trying to figure out how to talk about the Tao Te Ching in, in a podcast format where I could just share a few things. And I was like, well, I, I should narrow it down to a few chapters so that way we, we can cover them in an hour. And I went through the whole book and I was writing down the ones that I particularly enjoy. And it was quite a big list. It might as well have just been the whole book. And it took me a while to narrow it down. Um, but I narrowed it down to, to five um, that I, I believe are pretty representative of the Tao Te Ching. Um, there's a lot of really great themes that are mentioned in each one of these. Some of them are summaries because there are, there are kind of um, pieces of the Tao Te Ching that are repeated throughout the text. You know, when you're talking about the, the kind of balance of the balancing forces of Taiji, of yin and yang, that comes up quite a bit, um, how they complement and create each other. Uh, so there are some themes that are, that are pretty prevalent uh, throughout the text, and they're explained in different ways. So that way you begin to understand the principle and not just the singular example. So I think that's really important. I tried to, I tried to find a few um, pieces, a few chapters that went into that, and, and I think they have a lot of value. Like I, I do find myself, especially a couple of these, literally going back and reading them. Um, I've, I've kind of put them on my website and, and tried to share them as much because I, I do find that there's a lot of value in those words. And this translation is really nice. He doesn't take a lot of uh, grace and, and changing things to make it fit a certain cadence or poetry type feeling. He's translated things well enough that there's a little bit of that feeling of connectivity to the original, but it's still not taking any huge leaps away from the, you know, given text, which I think is really nice. So we'll only be going through five, so I should get started so we can actually get into the text. Okay, so I'm going to start with number five and we'll work towards number one. So the very first one that I want to share with you is actually the very first chapter of the Tao Te Ching. Um, I was debating on where to put this on the top five, and I think we just have to start with it uh, because it is the starting point of the text. It is the most important line, I think. Just the opening of the Tao Te Ching reads like this. The Tao that can be expressed in words is not the true and eternal Tao. The name that can be uttered in words is not the true and eternal name. The word nothingness may be used to designate the beginning of heaven and earth. The word existence may be used to designate the mother of all things. Hence, one should gain an insight into the subtlety of Tao by observing nothingness and should gain an insight into the beginning of Tao by observing existence. These two things, nothingness and existence, are of the same origin but different only in name. They are extremely profound in depth, serving as the door of the myriad secret beings. So that is chapter one, and it's it's a pretty profound chapter. You know, Dao Ke Dao Fei Chang Dao Ming Ke Ming Fei Chang Ming. This opening two lines of the Tao Te Ching I have always found really really important because it's specifying right at the beginning that the Tao that we can speak about in words is not the real and forever lasting Tao. It is only the name. It is the word that I can express to you that can help you understand what I mean. But you have to understand the meaning, not the word, right? So it's like, it's giving you this idea of like, language is not a perfect thing. It's not something that is going to be completely encapsulated in a moment. And I think that that's really important. And for me, reading that line at the beginning of um, a Taoist religious text, a Taoist philosoph philosophical text is really important to know a little bit about myself and my history. 
um, going from different religions, going from different practices growing up, I always find that this, this idea of self-justification and quantifying of a religion, of a philosophy is a loophole. You know, it's a self-rewarding system. If we have a religion that requires belief in order to survive, then there's kind of this loophole of, you know, it's, it's proving itself and that's the only reason it exists. And the reason I really like the Tao Te Ching opening with this line is it's basically saying, you know, we know that what we're saying is not necessarily the most important thing. We're going to say it. We're going to write a whole book about it. We're going to, we're going to teach it to you, but just remember that the teaching is just the method. The real understanding is the, you could say the internalization of that or the, the actual acceptance of it or however, but it's more, it's more than just these words, right? And I think that that is really, really important. And I think it shows a lot of, a lot of value to be able to put that on the first page to say, you know, this book isn't important. You don't need to read it, <laughs> but, but do. <laughs> and, and I think that that, that's, that's just a really great chapter to start with. It, it allows you to see kind of the, 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 the forces at play in the Tao Te Ching and how we're using this word to designate the beginning. We're using this to designate the, the creation of things. And you can understand things by observing this model and seeing how things come forth. And it is by connecting these patterns that we come to understand something deeply. But this understanding is separate from nature. This is still just a pattern that we've found, right? It's a way of understanding. This name, this language is a way of creating something so that we can share a commonality. But the commonality is higher than that. It ascends that meaning. It ascends that framework. So I think that that's really important and it's a big, it's a big chapter. It's very, very, very intense to start off with, but you kind of have to know that reading the Tao Te Ching that, you know, we're giving you principles. We're not giving you specific, you know, exactly followed to the letter absolutes, right? So the Tao Te Ching undermines itself with its first sentence, but I think with that first sentence, it proves itself all the more. You know, there are chapters later on that speak about some of the honorary mentions. There are, there are chapters later that speak about, you know, the greatest knowledge is knowing that you don't know everything. And we all know this, like this is something that gets passed around social media like crazy. I think a lot of these quotes that we get to later are going to be familiar just for that reason. But the cliche of it doesn't take away any of the truth, any of that value. You know, we, we do need to know these things. We do need to know that there's a lot more that we don't know you know? So chapter one, that is my number five. <laughs> okay. So moving right along, we'll go into number four. My number four is chapter eight. Now, this is probably going to be the most popularized uh, chapter that comes up a lot, uh, secondary only to, you know, uh, a journey of a thousand miles begins under your feet or begins with a single step. That's probably number one. But chapter eight is the goodness of water. Okay. So not my number four, chapter eight. The perfect goodness is like water. Water approaches all things instead of contending with them. It prefers to dwell where no one would like to stay. Hence, it comes close to Tao. A man of perfect goodness chooses a low place to dwell as water. He has a heart as deep as water. He offers friendship as tender as water. He speaks as sincerely as water. He rules a state as orderly as water. He does a thing as properly as water. He takes action as timely as water. Like water, he never contends with others, so he never commits a mistake. Chapter eight. So we all know the water quotes. We all know the um, be like water, you know, uh, any, any, any vessel that you find yourself in, any environment, you fill it, uh, you adapt to that 
you adapt to that situation, right? And so water is definitely one of the biggest metaphors that are used all over different cultures, but especially in Taoism. It is the foundation of life. It is the thing that is the only thing potentially that is perfect in creation, that naturally goes where it's needed. It's humble. It always goes to the lowest place. And therefore, it ends up being the superior in some ways, right? You cannot contend with something that doesn't contend with you. So it never makes a mistake. It's always in the proper moment, always in the proper time. So I really like this this idea. Um, This is a big one um, throughout the chapters. This is kind of explaining the theme. You know, like when we talk about... um, Things like choosing a low place to dwell as water. Later on, this talks about in society as a leader, those who humble themselves before. The leaders that treat themselves as servants to the people end up being the best leaders, right? And so there's this idea of, you know, putting yourself in the lowest position while you're technically a superior ensures that you're actually the superior, right? It's like an interesting interesting take on things you know later on there's other examples we talk about uh, the good person uses the bad person as a model and that is how they learn how they grow because you're 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 choosing to follow somebody i may not follow but you're choosing to uh, help someone you're you're offering charity where no charity will be given back you know you're offering trust where no one trusts you know, you're, you're willing to help the snake cross the river, even though it's going to bite you because that's your nature. You know, your nature is to benefit others without looking for payment, you know, without looking for recompense. And so there's this idea of, of, you know, being as sincere as water, being as low as water, being as adaptable as water. And that is something that is, you know, really a big principle throughout the Tao Te Ching. And so chapter eight is a, is an important one, definitely an, a very um, often quoted uh, chapter as well. But again, very, very valuable. I think, I think this idea of, of, of water and fire is kind of very prevalent in everything we do, not just in Taoism, but in martial arts, this balancing force of yin and yang. Um, you could talk about the energy of life depleting the jing, the water of our, of our body. And so you have this idea of there's always this preservation, this maintenance, this cleansing of our, our, our water, of our kind of our jing, our essence, right? our vitality. And I know I'm, I'm loosely translating some of that stuff just to talk about the principle, but I think that, that 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 analogy is important to make because that is kind of the idea that we're doing. We're trying to create a balance uh, so we don't have stagnant water. We have clean, pure water. You know, we have water that's easily moved and adaptable and, and, and you know, doesn't leak, doesn't waste doesn't smell bad (laughs) you know like there there is this idea of of just emulating the best properties of water you know so i think that i think that this analogy is really important water gets used in everything like the basis of meridian theory um, the the energetic system throughout the body is based off of water and and canals and gateways and paths and this circulation and so understanding your place your connection to water is really important you know, once again, the basis of all life is on water. So it makes sense that the basis of morality should be based on water as well. So uh, I think a really good connection in this chapter. Okay, so then we move on to number three. Number three, I'm actually jumping way ahead and going into what would be considered um, the, the second book. So the first book, the first, I think, 36 36 chapters or so, 37 maybe, in that area, that is the book of the Tao. So the first opening chapters have all been kind of organized. Um, These are all talking about the the kind of large scale, uh, what is the path, um, what defines it, what describes it, um, how would you identify it, how would you align yourself with it, right? And then the second book, um, somewhere in the 30s beginning, 
and then continuing to the end is the book of the and that is the virtue the book of virtue so that is where we're talking about how to carry conduct yourself so here we're giving an example of this is what water is like this is the natural uh, cosmic force that we're aligning with but then later on the chapters start talking about how do we actually apply that to the way we live to the way we find balance to the way we you know conduct affairs uh, run a country do things like this so the book of the is a little bit more tangible it's a little bit more applicable okay so that's my chapter 38 is my number three Chapter 38 is a little bit of a bigger one, so here it is. A man of the great virtue of the does not claim to be of virtue. Thus, he is of the true virtue. A man of small virtue always holds fast to the virtue in form. Thus, he is actually of no virtue. A man of the great virtue remains inactive without deliberately manifesting his virtue a man of the small benevolence keeps being active always deliberately manifesting his virtue a man of the great benevolence acts but never deliberately shows his benevolence a man of great justice acts and also deliberately shows his justice a man of rigid rights acts and even rolls up his sleeves to force people to conform to rights when no one responds to him. Therefore, virtue comes after the loss of Tao. Benevolence comes after the loss of virtue. Justice comes after the loss of benevolence. Rights come after the loss of justice. Thus, rights re result from the lack of loyalty and good faith and function as the beginning of the great disorder. Foresight is the only flowery embellishment of Tao, as well as the beginning of ignorance. Hence, the true man sets store by the thick rather than by the thin, and values the fruit rather than the flower. That is why he takes the former and discards the latter. Okay, so this is a big chapter, and I, I wanted to include this one because of the way it breaks down um, virtue. Okay. This is kind of the, uh, let me see. Oh, this is okay. So yeah, this is the first chapter of the book of the, so 38. So we're also starting with the first one and this is setting the stand, setting the scene, um, for what it means to be virtuous and why, you know, why is virtuous kind of the, the example, the role that we're trying to follow. And that is because Virtue is the closest step that we get to the natural Tao, right? It is that kind of not necessarily benevolent, not necessarily justice, not necessarily rites and etiquette and ritual and faith. Virtue is the unspoken written rule of nature, of pure growth, right? It is the way that we promote instead of uh, negate or take away from. It is giving without receipt, Okay. So I like the way it breaks it down, especially when you get to this line at the end of the first page, when it says a man of rigid rights acts and even rolls up his sleeves to force people to conform to rights when no one responds to him. I like this idea because we're working backwards. We're starting with the, the, the highest ideal of virtue and we're working down into benevolence, you know, into, into charity, into, you know, being a good person. And then you're, you're working down into justice where you're following a structure where it's like, no, these are the rules. We do this and this when there's something wrong. And then after the, after, after justice, then after we have that, we have just rights, you know, we have the etiquette, we have the ritual, we have the, I do this because this is the way it was done when I was ro raised, you know, we have that conversation. And once you get to there, now you're already down to the place where you don't have faith, you don't have good trust, you don't have belief in each other. There's no compassion. It's really just this ritual. It's, it's just this etiquette. It's this structure on a social level that's just being replicated up. And there might not be feeling invested into it. So this is, this is one of the big things where people talk about Taoism and, and Confucianism potentially having some conflict. And there's, there's debate on this, but just to, just to kind of point out some of the reasons why is because 
Confucianism kind of speaks as the the rites being the the window into uh, being a virtuous person. Now, even Confucian. Uh, Confucius comes out and says that you know he knows that the it's really the the intention that you uh, manifest during those rituals that creates them in their purest form. So you actually have to feel from the heart, you know, the what you're doing is proper, and it's not just you shouldn't just be following the methods because that's what's been laid out in front of you. And and here Taoism is agreeing with that. So I think Confucius and Taoism kind of agree; they just approach it differently. But there is some debate on that with, you know, just the the stringency put on ritual uh, throughout Confucian belief where, or Confucian practice where it's it, it can be kind of this this just system that you're following. You're doing this and this and this X, Y, Z to whatever situation. And here we're breaking it down to say like, you know, virtue is the highest level. Every step we take away from that leads to disorder, right? And so if you work your way back from that, you can see in the next page, you can see how once you lose each one, you know, you, you approach that chaos. But I think following them the other way around is also beneficial, right? So we have the rights, but the rights are meant, the rights and etiquette are meant to give you a structure. That's the lesson to show you the principle, to guide you. And once you have that guidance, then you can actually start to have justice. You know, you can apply that system in context. And if you can maintain an unbiased point of view, then you can actually start to show benevolence and mercy and charity and and actually be able to understand something, not just as a legal system, as an X, Y, Z for what situation, but you actually are able to find the principle in that system. Then you can elevate to benevolence and eventually to virtue to where you're doing the most appropriate action at the appropriate time and i think that that's 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 really important that that is something that again gets gets repeated this kind of pattern finding Uh, again here it says you know foresight is the is only the flowery embellishment of Tao, as well as the beginning of ignorance and i think that those two lines are overlooked sometimes but i think that that's pretty important because it's it's basically saying that once you understand these patterns, you might be able to understand things as they happen more in context, be able to not see the future, but in a way you're, you're understanding things and where they're leading to. And that idea is that that concept is really enlightening and it can really help you understand how to align with the Tao, but it is only, it is potentially a distraction, right? Because once you think you know, you undermine what you actually know because you you assume you plan you 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 kind of look for a certain uh, justification, right? And so there there is this idea that I think as you approach being a virtuous person, you're walking a knife edge, and the farther you get, the closer you get to the tip, the more on an edge that you are, and the subtleties that are needed to maintain that are really important. So we can start at the base and build up through etiquette and through rights and through a justice system and through benevolence. But eventually we have to reach a point where we're understanding things in their full context to where we can utilize the appropriate response. And oftentimes that becomes something where we're, we're, we're giving as much as we can without taking. That includes taking knowledge. That includes taking, you know, uh, whatever punishment might be or something like that. I think I think that offering your best side is very important. And that becomes a running theme through the second chapter, uh, through, sorry, through the second half of, of the Tao Te Ching uh, throughout the book of the kind of talking about how to be a virtuous person, how to um, continually manifest these into, you know, always promoting growth. Very important. Okay. So that is my my chapter Chapter 38, number three. Okay, so now we go into number two. And we're jumping back almost to the beginning to chapter 11. So, chapter 11. 30 spokes share one hub. It is just the space, the nothingness between them that makes the cart function as a cart. 
You can knead clay to make a vessel, and you find within it the space that makes the vessel a vessel. Within a house built with doors and windows, you will find the space that makes a house function as a house. Hence the substance, the being of something, can only provide a condition under which usefulness is found. But the nothingness, that empty space, is the usefulness itself. Okay, chapter 11. Uh, Yeah, this is my number two. I really, really like this one. And it's one of those things that the first time I read it, it's just like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's very intuitive. Um, It's this idea of emptying your cup, right? (laughs) It It is this idea of it is the space between that creates, right? If we had something that didn't have empty space, we wouldn't be able to distinguish one from the other, you know? So I think even in cases of non-tangible things, like in this sense, it's, it's like the, the metaphor is just punching you in the face, right? It's a house isn't useful unless it's hollow. You know, a boat isn't useful unless it's hollow. A cup isn't useful unless you can put stuff in it, right? And so, yeah, it's like, yeah, of course, this is like just common sense on one level. But if you take this principle and you apply it to something more intangible, like, like sound, like music, like cadence of someone's voice. It is the space between notes, uh, between phrases, between pieces of music that create contrast, that create the sound, right? And this is something that I, I want to go into in, in further detail in another episode, talking about art, talking about music and its role in, in not just philosophy, but in the way that we can understand things about ourselves and the way we can share and express ourselves. Um, I think that's very important. But I think this idea of emptiness is maybe one of my most favorite concepts um, that I find myself revisiting. In practice, we talk about emptiness uh, in meditation. We talk about kind of cleansing the body. Uh, We talk about the emptiness of breath, of emptying the mind, things like this. But even in things like Taiji, it is about the space that we create that allows us to do appropriate coordination techniques, movements, um, being able to do some of the special qualities of Taiji practice, creating that space between the tendons, um, being able to do these movements correctly involves making space. Having relationships with people, um, interactions involves manifesting space and understanding that balance right? So I think that this is like a pretty big epiphany moment for me when I first read this. Um, You know, one of the things that I've always really liked is in music, we always talk about, you know, playing the pauses and having those moments where the music stops. And for a moment, that music is still alive. It's alive in your ear. It's alive in your mind. It's alive in your heart for another moment. And even there's this anticipation with some music where you know what's coming next. And it's when that next note comes that the, the feeling is complete, you know. And then you have not just a song, you have a musical piece, right? But without silence, music just becomes noise, right? And so it's not about how many notes you can do. It's not about how much you can play. It's about how you space them apart, right? And I think that 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 idea is just something that I I continually find myself uh, applying to other things. You know, it's kind of the same thing as you interact with someone, being able to have uh, the space between the interaction and your emotions, whether it's something attached to the conversation at the moment or something that might be disturbing you from before. You know, you can carry uh, baggage, you can carry things with you from another part of your day, another part of your life. Even a memory could manifest and you could approach this situation differently because you don't have any space between that thought and this interaction. And I think a lot of our practice, especially in the early stages, like with meditation, like that is about creating that space. It's about kind of manifesting a bubble, not to keep things out, but in order to absorb and actually observe correctly. So we're not just gut reaction 
on every interaction. I think that's very important. So, yeah. Chapter 11, uh, I could go into that one for a long time, but I'm going to save a little bit of it for my next one. My my favorite number one chapter. <laughs> but before we go into that, I do want to stop and quickly let you know about my Discord channel. Uh, I have two different Discord channels. One is completely free called the uh, Wudang Community. Uh, there are links in the description. You can join that uh, on Discord. We have a lot of discussions about Tao Te Ching. We have people who talk about music. You know, Sometimes we can, we can schedule special meets there. Uh, there's a lot of resources that are archived that you can have access to. But also, I have a private side called the Ways of Wudang. And getting access to that, you would have to become a patron. But if you are very interested in the Tao Te Ching and these kinds of lectures, um, I think we went through the first 25 chapters already in the first series. And I go through each individual chapter and kind of talk about it in more detail, uh, explain some of the nuance and, and share some of my own perspective on it. So I did a lecture series on that already. Uh, we'll probably pick it up soon and go back through um, where we left off. Um, but if you're interested in Tao Te Ching and you like these kind of conversations, I, I recommend join us on Patreon and become a patron. Uh, you can have access to all that archived material. Uh, so yeah, there is a lot more of this. Uh, I, I do really enjoy this subject today, uh, just sharing with you a few. But if it's something you'd like to see more and, and listen to more of, uh, yeah, join us there and you can you can access all the archives. So, so now, without further delay... Number one, only moving a few chapters ahead to number chapter 16. The number one Jake certified favorite chapter of the Tao Te Ching, <laughs> chapter 16. I try my best to be in an extreme emptiness of mind. I try to keep myself in a state of stillness. From the vigorous growth of all things, I perceive the way they move in endless cycles. All things, full of vitality, finally return to their own roots. Returning to roots means stillness, also means a return to destiny. A return to destiny is known as the law of eternity. To understand the law is known as enlightening. He who is ignorant of the law is acting rashly, will be in great trouble. But he who knows the law is tolerant, and that tolerance leads to impartiality. Impartiality to thoroughness, thoroughness to nature, nature to Tao, and Tao to eternity. Thus, one will not be endangered all their life. Chapter 16 of the Tao Te Ching. This is my favorite chapter. Um, for a bunch of different reasons. I think that this one gets kind of overlooked quite a bit. Um, one of the reasons I do like it is in the Chinese. It does have the character of my Taoist name, Gen, of Roots. <laughs> uh, that's not really the reason why I like the chapter, but it's a happy coincidence. Um, this one, I think it, it the reason it stands out to me is most of the text is written in this kind of uh, third person kind of um, almost not a lecture, but almost like an answer. Like, this is what you do here. This is what you do here. Make sure you don't do that. Uh, follow this path to align yourself with Tao, you know, kind of like a, a teaching moment. There are a few chapters that come out and speak in this way that, that seem like, um, a description of the author that, that to kind of, kind of come off as almost a promise to oneself. Like, this is my goal. This is the this is the path of cultivation that I've set forth on. And I think by reading these words, I, I kind of hope that I'm aligning myself with that idea as well. You know, this idea of I'm trying my best to be in extreme emptiness of mind, trying to keep my state, uh, trying to keep myself in a state of stillness, you know, trying to concentrate on the Dantian, trying to, trying to meditate on uh, creating that space, right, from chapter 11. And then we talk about this idea of perceiving the way things grow and understand how they move in cycles, understand this pattern, right? For me, that's, that's really the whole idea that I've had with, you know, 
discovering and, and trying to understand more about philosophy is trying to connect the dots and trying to see these patterns and relationships and connections and understanding that pattern, right? I think by understanding that pattern, we can return ourselves to the center point, right? Talking about giving yourself into this idea of emptiness of mind is really important. You know, one of the, one of the great stories we talk about uh, by creating this space, uh, by maintaining this, this idea, is a pretty old story. Uh, originally comes from the Zhuangzi. Um, and there's the, 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 uh, the monk that's traveling and decides to go out and do his meditation practice. And he sets out on a boat on the lake and he's meditating and drifting along with the current. And he hears and feels another boat bump into his boat. And before he even opens his eyes, he gets angry and starts imagining all the things he's going to yell at this other person. And then when he opens his eyes and he clenches his fist and looks in the other boat, he discovers the other boat is empty and there's no one in the boat. And the story says that at that moment, he understands that the anger was not something outside of him that he was reacting to. The anger was inside of him even during a meditation practice, even during the years of training. It was something that lived underneath the surface. And because there was no one in the boat to direct his anger at, his anger was useless, and it was an unnecessary reaction. And at that moment, he finally kind of achieved enlightenment and was understood that, you know, this needs to be absolved from within, and I need to treat every interaction with emptiness. I need to treat this as if it was an empty boat. And I should understand that it's not the person, even if there was a person in the boat, it's not their reason that created my anger. I created the anger, my reaction, my lack of empty space. And so I think kind of bringing yourself into that idea, trying to, trying to accept that stillness but not just accepting it in the best possible conditions, also putting yourself in a position where you're within that system of growth and change and transformation and conflict even. I think that that's important to still maintain that idea of stillness, that idea of space. You know? Because if we can create our own emptiness, our own bubble, our own space, then we have more time to react in not a passive way, but in an appropriate way, in an effortless way. And this is when we start talking about ideas like Wu Wei, Wei Wu Wei, you know, action without action, you know, a action without effort, you know. I think that this is, is very, very important. And as you can do that, you can kind of see things in their full picture because you're not looking through a distorted lens of, for example, emotion, right? Uh, you're looking at it not necessarily from just a purely analytical, logical point of view, but you're definitely able to take in more information and be able to judge more appropriately. And it'll hopefully see the connections. You know, another another chapter we talk about the the wise person sees the similarities and pays less attention to the differences. You know, I think that's something we should all strive towards is, is trying to connect things rather than separate things. You know, we shouldn't divide, we should unite. Um, and we should do our best to find the, the path, not just of least resistance, but the path that actually strengthens that connection. Right. And so I think that, you know, this is, this is very important. You know, when we, when we think of things like the, like the Taiji system, the Taiji, Taiji picture of yin and yang transforming and complementing, absolving and transforming into one another. You know, I think that this is kind of the, the simplified picture of everything, right? We have this balance of opposite forces and every cause has an equal and opposite reaction, you know, or every action has an equal and opposite reaction in a way. And so when we understand that, we can see that connection and that transformation, then we can find the pattern and we re can return to the center, right? If you imagine the Taiji picture of everything turning and churning around you, if you understand where that motion is coming from, then hopefully as you find balance, you find yourself in the middle and you become the pivot point. 
And then you can observe those things. That's what we mean when we say we finally return to their own roots. They find that point of balance in the center and everything revolves around and you can stay still without getting caught in the loop, <laughs> without getting taught, caught in the churn. And this is your return to destiny. This is the law of eternity. This is when you can find your enlightenment. This is when you can find your, your, your true purpose. Of course, I think that can be left to openness to interpretation because we can all have a different balance point, right? But then we talk about this and, you know, you'll be in great trouble if you don't because you're only going to be stuck in that loop. But if you know that rule, then you become tolerant. That tolerance leads to impartiality, right? That space, that, able, that ability to, to put things to the side and kind of wait will allow you to be impartial, will allow you to see things better and with clarity and context and proper judgment. And that judgment will allow you to actually think, I need to make sure I do this appropriately. You know, Confucius says, if we set out to do something, we should do it 100%. You know, we should leave no work undone. You know, the Tao Te Ching later on says, um, small promise breaking leads to large promise breaking. And it is not because the way is difficult or easy. It is that the sage, the, the enlightened person, the adept, imagines the easy things as being equally difficult. And in that sense, nothing is difficult because everything is taken at a high value. You know, like even those soft promises, you know, you pinky promise a, a, a child that is the most important promise, you know, for example, you know, because that the character that you show during those small moments is only reflected in the large moments. So, you know, take care of things before they become mountains. Work with anthills first. So now we become thorough. We become, we understand that, you know, just because I'm impartial doesn't mean I can just make judgment. I have to know the context. I have to complete the story. Right? So we have to be thorough. Once we're thorough, we lead to nature. And so once you understand the full context, it's not a choice anymore. You know, it's, it's kind of a road that leads you to a certain destination. Because if you understand the full picture, then it's obvious what should happen. Hopefully. That is nature. And nature, that path of growth, is Tao. That is what allows us to actually align with that system of growth. And in this way, we will not be endangered all our life. So hopefully that'll put you into green pastures and sunny fields. <laughs> so that is chapter 16. Um, that is my favorite chapter. Um, there's a lot um, in each one of those sentences, I think. And I think that there's ways that we can apply this kind of knowledge to our everyday life, our practice, our philosophy, our perspective, our worldview. And I think that it's good to know that that can change and evolve and adapt. And that's something that Tao Te Ching says is that, you know, these words will change and they will mean different things at different times to different people. But that's part of the Tao, I suppose. That is part of nature. Find those roots. And I think we all find our way. So That is the top five list certified as of today. Uh, I hope that is um, interesting to you and hopefully... Uh, hopefully, you know, you're, you're diving into your own Tao Te Ching. Um, that is only a mere fraction of what the Tao Te Ching, I think, has to offer. But it's a, it's a piece that's important for me. I hope that you enjoyed and uh, can share in that. So, yeah. Like I said, I always find myself revisiting this text, so it's nice to find another excuse to do so. <laughs> so, thank you guys for hanging out with me today. Um, until next time. Here's to finding balance, one cup and one page at a time. Cheers. 
Thank you for tuning into today's episode. Subscribe and join me every Tuesday for new episode releases, also available wherever you get your podcasts. Support the Ways of Wudang through Patreon and get access to resources, classes, and more. Keep the conversation going with hashtag T-Talk unfiltered or connect with me directly by joining the Ways of Wudang on Discord. Links are in the description. I'll talk with you next time for another cup of tea.